So as a very young drummer, just thought, this is it. This is everything for me. I saw this massive transformation in the way we lived. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. But I'm a drummer. I'm just, I'm going to be a drummer. I'm going to be a famous rock drummer. And just sort of asking the questions a little bit. Mm. So I started to think, what else can I do to make money? Because it was really kind of a, a kick in my tail to start thinking about other ways to generate money. And then it became, what kind of life do I want to live? All right, you guys, welcome back to the Let It Up podcast. If you're new to this channel and you want to know everything there is about making money in real estate, selling, sales skills, building your business or investing, then subscribe below, hat, tap the bell for notifications so you can be the first to know what makes our great guests so successful. Let's talk about adding leverage. So we've been getting a lot of calls of people asking us how we've hired virtual assistants to scale and leverage our business. So we've opened up our playbook to all of you. If you're looking to add leverage in your business, whether it's administrative support, ISA outbound callers, go to adleverage.com and they'll be there to help you staffing your team. All right. Today we have Roger King. Roger, thanks so much for being here. Hey guys, thanks for inviting me in. I appreciate it. Yeah, man. We're excited to uh, spend some time with you today and, and learn a little bit more about what you're doing within your business. So again, thank yeah. you for uh, for spending some time with us. Yeah, man. I'm here to serve. Let's do it. But first, lightning round. All right. Oh. Okay. <laughs> we didn't. We did not prepare him for this. Yep. We're just hitting you with a few questions just to get to know you a little bit better, as we always sure. do. Right. So. Okay. Not necessarily real estate related, but we'll we'll go from there. Audio jungle. All right, Roger, when you die, what do you want to be remembered for? It's a deep question. Hmm. Wow. How long is this thing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, I think obviously I want to be remembered for being kind. I want to be remembered for helping. I want to be remembered for loving my friends and my family. And I really want to be remembered for just serving our real estate investor community in the biggest way that I possibly could ever get to. And I don't know what that means today. I just know that I want to keep serving and, and over deliver as much as I can. So, you know, doing a billion podcasts, you know, uh, creating a thousand courses and coaching a billion students, whatever that looks like <laughs> or, or however I get there, really. Yeah. I just want to, I just want to help. Love it. Good answer. Let's say you okay. won the $1.3 billion Powerball. How would you spend the money? Well, I'd, I'd certainly set up a couple of trusts to ensure privacy, number one, and then immediately pay off all of my investors and all of my projects so that they felt like, oh, this is a, a wonderful you know, thing. And then I would probably create some scholarships mm. in a few different areas. Number one, if you know anything about my background, I'm a musician. So I went to Berkeley College of Music in Boston, and I want to create a couple of different scholarships over there, you know, drummers and performance, people who can't really afford the school, but also business majors. Hmm. I'd like to set up some family trusts, some different other pet and, and animal shelters. Yeah. I'd like to set up something massive here on Puerto Rico's island because we have about 500,000 stray dogs. Wow. Wow. So, you know, I think there's some some good that can come of all of it. I'd certainly like to buy a plane or two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a couple of toys. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious know? to know. Wait, so what else would you do? Is that so you'd buy a couple of planes, you do the trusts? I feel like you only scholarship. made it to like three or four hundred million there. Yeah, I think you're right. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I think that education would be a major part of it. You know, I think that there are so many gifted people out there, young people that just don't have some of the opportunities that I've been afforded and I want to help them. I just want to give that money away, you know, make them work for it, not, not just give everybody, you know, here's $10,000. Yeah. But I would say, look, you, you know, if you come in, even though if you don't have grades, if you can have a compelling story or compelling reason that you deserve or you want it badly enough, mm. you know, I think that that would qualify. Yeah. Love it. And that's, to me, that's, 
Yeah, that's a couple hundred million. Yeah. Right there. <laughs> literally. Yeah. So yeah, I mean I you just got more I to just, go. Yeah, I know. We still have, <laughs> I mean maybe 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 a boat, <laughs> yeah. you know, and a couple of houses. But you know, once I pay off all my investors, all of that money is still profit, you know, coming in. So yeah. I would just uh I just, you know, whatever I can do to help. Really, yeah. I want to serve privately. Yeah. I want to do it somehow privately. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. You know. John, how about you? Yeah. What would you spend the money on? Yeah. Yeah. Get the pressure off of Roger, right? <laughs> he only spent two <laughs> two hundred million. <laughs> no, I, I, yeah. I think you hit a lot of the things that I would have touched upon, plus some things that I probably you know did not have top of mind. Like you said, scholarships. I mean, you made me think of giving back to my my undergraduate. I went to NYU for my master's for like uh, you know like for real estate finance, giving back to them. Yeah. You know the boat. Would also help. I have I have a place on the water without a boat. I have a dock without a boat, which mm. is very sad. It's a sad one. It's a sad. sad. It's sad. it's a goal. It's not sad. It's a goal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's a dream. It, yeah. It's the only thing I haven't pulled the trigger on, which is unlike me. But I, I keep hearing like my real estate coaches of the past saying like, buy another property first, <laughs> have the property pay for the boat yeah. or something like that. But yeah. But until I'll get you get there. to a certain point, look, you know, boats are just notoriously bad investments. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you have to really want it. Yeah. They said you, instead you should get a friend with a boat, which I, I've got a few, <laughs> a few of those. That's right. good. Yeah. There you All go. Right. And they can dock it at your house. Yeah. Exactly. I got one more question here for you, Roger. What was the cool. hardest decision you ever had to make? The hard, that's a spectacularly good question. Yeah. Because looking back, you know, on some of the difficult choices, the decision itself was easy. I would say getting out of some bad deals and not trying to push through. Mm -hmm. Maybe even relationships, you know, a couple of couple of relationships you really want to work or a couple of business deals you really want to work. And you're just saying, how can I navigate it? Mm -hmm. You know, I've got all these tools. I've got all this coaching. I've got all this. But it's just not getting there and getting to that point of. I have to get out of this. Mm. I think that those are the most difficult decisions I've had. Some in business and some in, in just personal relationships. Yeah, no, of yeah. course. Well, let me ask you this one. We'll go into it. If you could spend a day with someone dead or alive, who would it be and why? I'm, I'm thinking about all the famous musicians, you know, like part of me wants to say Miles Davis, mm. but God, he probably wouldn't want to hang out with me. <laughs> <laughs> he just wouldn't answer any of my questions. He just, <laughs> He'd probably be very standoffish, so I wouldn't say him because that would be a wasted, wasted wish. But yeah. um, you know, I, I mean, there are so many figures in history. Hmm. You look at um, obviously people would immediately say Jesus, and I think that that would be a tremendous experience mm -hmm. um, just to really get into his head and be able to take that, you know, that day and say, "Look, this is what he said." Yeah. And how would that change the world? Yeah. You know. Yeah. Because I know that today there's such a there's such a disconnect between some of the teachings and some of the actions, mm -hmm. and that you know I just it's a little confusing to me. Yeah. So no maybe idea. Jesus. Good as, answer. How about you guys? As much as I as much as I tease Kiro <laughs> about that question every time, it's so interesting yeah. to see what people respond with. You know, some people are like, "Oh, I lost my mother when I was very young. I'd love to spend another day with her." Other people say, "We've sure. heard a lot of people say Jesus. Yep, we've had a lot yeah. of people say one. Bill Gates. We've had Elon Musk. We've yep. had yeah different investors." It's a good question, but it's 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 an uh, it's an okay question. The, thanks, the, but the, the the thing that comes to mind more than anything else just is just because it's his question. You initially went <laughs> to a musician, so you had a, a, a strong music background. How did you get introduced to real estate in the first place? That's a great question. So as a very young drummer, you know, my first song that I learned how to play on the drums was Don't Stop Believing" in 1981 when it came out mm. on an eight track in my garage in Florida and just thought, this is it. This is everything for me. And as my dad got into real estate about a year before that, I saw this massive transformation in the way we lived. We suddenly went from one car to two to five mm. for a family of four. And I thought, wow, this is amazing. But I'm a drummer. I'm just, I'm going to be a drummer. I'm going to be a famous rock drummer, whatever that meant to me at the time. And I was also watching my dad, you know, come home with these massive checks. Mm. 
you know, cause he was buying and fixing up some houses and, and selling odor financing. And he flipped a couple of contracts and, you know, he'd say, Hey, I just closed a deal and let's, you know, let's go to Disney world for the weekend. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. And, and just sort of asking the questions a little bit. Hmm. And that's when I became aware of it. And then I realized after having been at college for a little while and watching some of my friends who had already like a guy I went to school with, he was 19 and I was a few years older and he'd already been on the tonight show playing drums. And, you know, it was just like, there's such, such competition. And I wasn't really good at not comparing myself to other people. Mm. So I started to think, what else can I do to make money? Because, if that guy's on the tonight show, what am I going to get to do? Yeah. Yeah. So it's really kind of a, a kick in my tail to, to start thinking about other ways to generate money. And then it became what kind of life do I want to live as, as the music thing was playing out in a very different way than I anticipated. Yeah. What did your father do before he was in real estate? It's interesting to hear you say that he got into real estate yeah. But he, it sounded like he was into something before. So I'm just thinking like, oh, yeah. I, I was picturing, you did a great job of telling that story. I was picturing like him sort of transitioning. Totally. We were all, you know, born in Cincinnati, Ohio. And we moved to Florida when I was 10. Mm. And in Ohio and then transitioned to Florida, he had created a company called Decorative Stone. Mm. And basically it, we, we took these sheets of plywood, we made a little frame, we put some dye powder in there, and then we poured cement on it and we'd let it cure. We'd crack it. We'd put it on the walls, exterior or interior. Mm -hmm. And it still, I mean, this is now 50 years later, it still lasts on houses in Englewood, Florida, where I grew up. Wow. And so he's, he was doing the decorative stone and then it transitioned into stucco because it's Florida. Mm -hmm. So at some point, and I don't, you know, it's a good question. I don't even know what the transition in his brain, how to do from stucco over to, 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 <laughs> to real, real estate. estate. Yeah. You know, how do you do that jump? I don't know, but he did. Yeah. And uh, it just, it's changed my course uh, of my path too. So he was a stucco guy, <laughs> a contractor. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I feel like everybody has somebody in their life who had some sort of real estate push this this crazy world of real estate on them rather whether yeah. it be a family member or a father or a friend yeah. or somebody in the business um and you know it's interesting just to hear how everybody gets in so were you an agent from from the beginning or were you never. did you start it you never were an agent never i i mean i took my test yeah i so when i got out of college in 90 90 at the end of 95 and 96 We'd formed a, an investment company in Orlando, my brother-in-law, my dad and I, and I was just driving for dollars, you yeah. know? And at the time, Ron Legrand, I had his CDs and I was just listening every morning from nine to 11, driving around, listening to him talk about lease options and wholesaling and, uh, you know, just the fix and flip thing. And how do you, you know, it's a dollar per square foot for carpet. I'm like, wow, okay. So I'm just amassing all of this information and I finally found a house and it was abandoned hmm. and we went through the whole process and and i said dad i can't find the seller anywhere or the owner anywhere he goes well try the probate office what's probate dad yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. and so he tells me that and i find where it is downtown orlando i go there i find the property i find that there's an attorney who worked on it i go home i call them they said yeah we we actually own that house now she passed away three years ago. Mm. And um, if you're interested in, in buying it, make an offer, fax it over to us. And so <laughs> my brother-in-law and I sat there and I said, well, Ron Legrand says we could just offer 5,000 bucks. And so mm. we did. We faxed over a contract uh, for $5,000. She literally calls me 10 minutes after getting it. And she says, you know, Mr. King, <laughs> We can't accept that. It's I understand what you're doing, but we just can't accept anything that low. I said, okay, what could you accept? Another like trick that I learned from, I think that was Tony Robbins by then. Mm. And she said, we can't take anything less than 10,000. <laughs> like, okay, <clears throat> that's fine. Okay, let me <laughs> let me consult my brother-in-law partner. Yeah. And uh, right, and and I'm like scratching it, uh, whiting it out on the contract, putting 10,500 and then faxed it over and literally 10 minutes after that, we get a signed copy of it back. And I had my first contract. Amazing. 
Four days later, I think, we uh, had the Flo Central Florida Real Estate Investor Club. I'd made a flyer. I go up to the front of the room. Hey, everybody, I've got this house. You know, if you want to see it, come down to the back of the room. I met up with, you know, 10 or 20 people, whatever. And this contractor said, I want to buy it. I'll give you $35,000 for it. I'm like, let's talk. So mm -hmm. in three weeks, I made my first 25 grand. So did you close on it or you sold them the, the you, you wholesale just it? sold a contract. Yeah. yeah. Just flipped the contract. Just assigned it. Yeah. So that was a, a combination of Ron Legrand and my dad. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I'm sure it was lights out after that. You were like, there's, there's forget you threw your drum set out the window and you're like, no. forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely did not throw the drum set out the window. I've, you know, I still own 12. Uh, All kidding you know, aside so, though, but that had to be like yeah. the, the lights, you know, the well, light bulb moment yeah. where you're like, this is what I'm going to do. This proof of doable. concept. Yeah. Yeah. Proof of concept. And what I immediately did is because I was listening to so much Ron LeGrand is like, let's get bandit signs. Mm. Let's get these signs. We buy houses cash. And I put up, you know, 60, 70 of them, you know, just me writing them out on my floor in my bedroom and thinking, this is awesome. Literally within 10 days, I had three properties under contract. Wow. Two of them were lease option and another was an owner finance. So you at this time, you said you had just graduated Berkeley. And by the way, I should note, I mean, I have some buddies who went to Berkeley and and um, I would say they were not the most um, business minded. Uh, yes. Business minded. <laughs> yeah. yeah. A lot of them were like very chill and just wanted to, you know, play music yeah. in, in mom's basement. And and, sure. and don't get me wrong, probably the best musicians I know but yeah. not necessarily knocking out doors and wanting to put up uh, bandit signs. Yeah. I don't know. There's part of me that uh, just loved the idea of that whole thing. Yeah. You know, part of me is very gregarious, let's say, you know, uh, engaging. I want to talk with people. Other parts of me are just like, stay away. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe that's why I live on a tropical island. By yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but there was some aspect of you that said, all right, well, listen, if, you know, this yeah. is not going to, I can do this and I love it but it's not gonna yeah. pay the bills, so. That's right, yeah, but this will, this yeah. other thing can. Right. How can I do both? How can I live that dream a bit and live the real estate dream? Because gosh, we just made 25 grand in yeah. three weeks, holy cow. Yeah. Now it did take six months of me driving for dollars to get that first property under contract. Yeah. But that's part of the learning curve. Right. Yeah. What now, was? I'm, I'm sure there's people real quick that, that are gonna say, oh, well, you know, and again, I know it was, the first house was 10,500, but you know, how did, how did you have the money to start? Did you get that from family? Did you borrow it? Did you, cause you said you had three under contract shortly after. Yeah. Lee wholesale that he didn't need to have any money for that 10,500. Well, true. Yeah. I mean, we put up, uh, I think, so at the time my brother-in-law was financing the company. Yeah. We put up a, f probably a $500 deposit on the, you yep. know, ask, uh, earnest money deposit. So yep. not too much. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was, you know, that all got washed, uh, you know, into the wash of how the business was operating. I was going to say those other three, you said it's seller financing and two lease options. Were those to hold? Yeah, they were. So then yeah, you were they, thinking about yeah. holding early on as well. So not even just. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Smart. Build some cash flow. Okay. Yeah. That's, you know, that's, at that's... the same time, because there were three of us, let's also fix and flip. Mm. How can we, you know, how multifaceted thing. And then as things, as we started to gain momentum, my brother-in-law and I and my father, we started to have some conflict about how things should be run. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, and my brother-in-law and I are nearly the same age, you know, uh, so at the time we're what, 27, 28. And uh, it was just trying to get my dad to do things a little bit differently than he'd ever done. And he's, you know, 15 years ahead of us in the business. Mm -hmm. So he had his ways of doing things. You know, my brother-in-law and I were like, let's try this, let's try this. And he's like, you know, kind of shooting down our ideas and we're getting, you know, frustrated that this, you know, we could do this, we could do this. And my dad's like, yeah, yeah but what happens if they do this to you or do that to you? And I'm like, whatever, <laughs> you know, being young and impetuous and I know everything yeah. ego, you know, so we split. <laughs> <laughs> I started to go play drums again. Okay. And got it, got in a local band in Orlando. We toured the country and, you know, I uh, was making $400 a week, but wow, was I having fun. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, there was definitely a trade off with the cash, <laughs> but there was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah. It was like sure. a good rebellious, uh, uh, tour yeah. more or less. So when yeah. you, 
When did you know that you had something scalable that you could build here? I, I would say instantly uh, when I got that property into contract. Okay. I saw it all. I mean, that's, I don't mean that in uh, any sort of an egotistical way. Mm -hmm. It just made logical sense to me how we can do this thing, how we can do this thing. I guess my brain compartmentalizes the structure. Yeah. And so it just made sense. This is this thing. Some of these things in this way are different than that. And so we switch this thing around a little bit, if that mm -hmm. makes sense. Right. And I don't know why my brain just operates that way. It just does. Yeah. Um, for better, for worse. Yeah. Looking back at your 28 year career, what would you say is something that you would push on a new investor trying to get into the business now? Like how would, should they strategize going into it? Yeah, I think, and I've thought a lot about this, you know, we either have or need one or two or three of time, money, or experience. Mm -hmm. We can either go driving for dollars every day for five hours because we have all the time in the world and we just, you know, we've got that available to us. Or let's say we're a surgeon and we have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars, but we don't know how to deploy it. We don't have the time mm -hmm. and we don't have the experience. Or let's say we're a contractor and we have all of the experience, but we don't necessarily have the time because we're working on the jobs, but we have, you know, the experience and the money. Mm -hmm or some combination of that, right? Yeah. So how does somebody really do thorough self-assessment of what their gifts are and what do they need? Mm. I think, tell me if I'm wrong, there's, you know, it's one of those three things. You, you either need more time, you either need more experience or you need more money. Yeah. And when you can really narrow that down, that's gonna inform what type of real estate investing you're gonna do. And if you couple that with season of life, then you're going to have a really super clear picture because that surgeon likely won't want to get up and go fix and flip 10 houses a year. Mm -hmm. Even though he could, he may have both the experience and the money, but he may not want to spend the time that way. Mm -hmm. So I just, I kind of conceptualize it around that. If you're clear on your 26 You've got no time and no money, but you, your dad, you know, hired you as a contractor when you were a kid. You've got a big jump, you know, head start. Mm -hmm. But if you're 26 and you don't have any experience or money, but you've got a lot of time, you know, you can start. Go put up bandit signs. Yeah. You know, go wholesale a house. Try to scale that to a house a month and mm -hmm. then scale it to five a month. Take some of that profit and put it away, build it up and then start buying, you know, uh, a fourplex. Yeah. You know, I mean, and live in one of the units. Yeah. I would totally do that if it were, if I were starting over with, you know, with the experience I have now, I would do that. I'd wholesale a bunch of properties, buy a fourplex, live in one of the units and, and just grow that burr method as they call it. Yeah. And, and just, you know, rinse and repeat. What's okay. one thing you would do different? Looking at what? If it's starting over? Knowing what you know now. Yeah. So for us, we got into the real estate business and it's it, when you were saying that concept, it resonated so much because you have, you're investing a lot of time, you're making a lot of money, but, or no, you're getting a lot of experience and you're making yeah. a lot of money, but you're not having enough time to actually focus on the actual, although you're in the business, you're not thinking about it in a different way. You're just focusing on sales and transactions. I think what I would have done differently is never sell a thing, just constantly try to buy more. And instead of bragging about having a great list to sell price ratio, be like, all right, I'm going to buy this and keep the margin. Yeah. <laughs> right. well, what we both kick ourselves for is like we, we both went. I, I don't know. Ron Legrand. Do you know Ron? Yeah. The I one think? with the, the, the he's been mentioned several times. No, I know. I know that Roger mentioned him several times, but are you familiar with him? Yeah. Through what? Just, through just through her own. No. Um, what's her name? She was from Texas. She mentioned him. She or she found a bunch of his CDs from eBay. Jessica Nelson. No. <laughs> she, it's like we're trying to because his CDs are like they, some people sell them on eBay for like a crap ton of money because yeah. they're like historic, but they're still very valuable. And she's yeah, like, I'm going to make are. my own spin on it. It sounds familiar. And I'm just trying to think, of it, you know, where I've heard of it. But he's out of Jacksonville. I mean, my dad met him in probably 82 or 83. Yeah. So, you know, 10 years before I'd even heard of the guy. Yeah. You know, and. Carlton Sheets was, I wouldn't Carlton say Sheets. Carlton Sheets was his mentor, mm -hmm. but he got some inspiration from the guy. Yeah. You know, so we're talking 80s, early 90s. Yeah. 
So Kiro and I both come from the, um, the Mike Ferry coaching program, like in, in real estate, yeah. the, the listing agent side of the business. And, you know, we both spent a lot of years and we still do um, hunting for listings, right? Yes. On the phone every morning, 8 to 11. Yeah. Call, 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 expires, withdrawn, canceled for sale by owners trying to find listings. And I, I think if I would, what I would do differently is just try to purchase a lot more of these properties rather than, than listing them. Yeah. Right. I've always wondered because I went to a Tom Ferry conference in Vegas mm, yeah. four years ago, five years. I thought it was spectacular. Yeah. If I ever wanted to be an agent, I would go and do exactly what he did. Yeah. What he was teaching. I thought it was spectacular. Yeah. My question to you guys, because you're already in that mindset, right? Get on the phone, call these people. Have you ever thought of saying, look, I I know that you've got an expired listing. I may actually want to buy it. And not just relist it. That's that's and, what that's where we are today. But I want you to owner finance it. Yeah. So, in this crazy world of this podcast and all the things that Kira and I are involved in, whether it's yeah. investment side or listing agent <clears throat> side, we're slowly over the last two three years coming to this realization that we spend so much time hunting for these opportunities, and then like what we've done over the last couple of years is you know find that seller who's motivated. Mm -hmm. get them to put it on the market and sell it to somebody else. And don't get me wrong, we make a nice commission, 2%, 3%, $10,000, $15,000, which is great. That's a lot sure. of money. However, the seller made $100,000, right? And he owned the property, so he's the one who took the risk. But why didn't we just buy the property from him? So to answer yeah. your question, yes, what we should have been doing, in my opinion, is trying to find, trying to buy more of these properties and you know see what we could do with them, wholesale them, yeah. uh, buy and hold them, flip them do something else. Yep. And I, I've said this a number of times. It's, you know, I used to say, oh, well, you know, I don't have all the money to do that. And it's not that I've come across a, a large amount of money, but you could be creative. Like you said, seller financing. Yeah. We've talked to guys like Pace Morby who have taught us how to do subject to. Uh, we've, yep. we've got hard money lenders who will give you financing for 90, 80, 90, 100 percent of the deal. So, you, you know, or just take on a partner. There's really no excuse. You're right. I'm sorry. I agree. There is no excuse, but you know, there's also, I, I've seen some of these guys and I'm not going to mention names because I respect what they do, but there are, and this is my, I guess my dad coming out of me, mm. there are problems with the way some of these things are being structured. And I would say that, you know, somebody was mentioning, I saw on Instagram a few days ago that they will do a deed and just put it in their, you know, have the seller deed it over to them, but they won't record the deed. They're mm -hmm. doing a deed uh, in escrow. Uh, yeah. And there's so many problems with that. And if, if, and until you go through the prop, those problems, you don't understand the real big result of not, you know, not listening to other people that have been around for 15 years longer that have gone through those major potentially catastrophic problems. Yeah. Yeah. You know, because if, if somebody, if that seller, as an example, gives you a deed and you choose not to record it, and you're operating that for a year or two and you get a, a buyer in on that deed, you know, and you're doing a kind of a subject to what happens if the original seller gets a lien for a right. million dollars against them and the attorney finds it. Yeah. The house is still in their name. Yeah. Bad news. Yeah. Well, that's the problem with social media these days. Anybody can be, you know, a coach and anybody can sort yeah. of preach what they, what they're doing yeah. or what works for them. But that's actually yeah. a really good point. I never even thought yeah. about that. Because I was always thinking if you put a deed in escrow, it might be smart to cloud title. But if it's like a, let's say it's a tax lien that he got like a personal income tax lien that gets put on the house because it's deed under him, you're screwed. Uncle Sam's going to get it paid first priority. no matter what. Yeah. 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 That's, that's a really good thought process. Wow. So then you ask, what's the other solution to that, right? Yeah. How do you do the same deal, but structure it with different entities in order to save that. And I would say, go ahead and put that property into a trust, Florida land trust, Illinois land trust, Nevada land trust, Delaware. They all have the, these different statutes that allow you to put it into a trust. And then that trust owns the house. Joe Schmo no longer owns the house. Yeah. Then you have all sorts of freedom yeah. and, and safety. Yeah. I, I guess the only reason why they ever pitched, because you get the tax benefit if it's under your name, but if it's not and you're doing the deed in escrow, that's solely if you're scared of the due on sale clause. So it's like, a, it's a double-edged sword either way at yeah. that point. Yeah. That's a good one. What other things do you see that you would caution people to be careful of getting into? Mm. I think you guys have probably been around long enough 
to know that there are millions of deals out there, mm -hmm. but there's probably 10 people you ever want to do business with in terms of a partnership mm -hmm. or some kind of an agreement, because I have found that whenever I thought, oh, this is a nice guy, this is a good guy, he doesn't have the chops to or the fortitude, the emotional ethics to see the problem through, to finish signing his documents and getting things done the way he's suggested that he's about to or mm -hmm. should, and he just doesn't follow through. And if something starts to go bad, you know, people, you don't know how people are going to respond. Mm -hmm. So how can you really make sure that your joint venture agreements are ironclad? You know, what sort of poison pills can you put into those joint venture agreements so that if they don't do something listed, then you have the ability to take back the property and conduct business the way it needs to get conducted. Yeah. And so I would just say, be very cautious of who you're doing business with. Yeah, that's true. And proactive with your written agreements. Really, yeah. I think that's cr such a critical thing. And that's only because I've found some found out the bad, hard way. Bad people. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> some, just bad people, you know. And uh, you don't know until you find out. And it's tough, tough lessons. Yeah. So, but as we were preparing for today's episode off camera, you had told us that uh, you've got a lot of um, mobile home parks. Yeah. Why don't you talk to us about yeah? Why those? Well, well yeah. Talk to us about. I mean, I think why you mobile? Know why? But um, <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I'm curious. <laughs> you, I, you would invest in a mobile home park? Yeah. Really? Uh, well, so I'll I'll just give you my my background yeah. real quick. Yeah, yeah. Out of college, I worked at a, a real estate um, private equity company, and what we would do is purchase mobile home parks in somewhere in the south. I mean, we're in Jersey, so I think somewhere in maybe the Carolinas, maybe some in Georgia, some in Florida. Yeah. And I remember we had a few that were near like um, army bases and mm -hmm. the upside for us, and, and you tell me if it's changed or if you guys have similar thoughts, was that, you know, it's a nice piece of land that eventually could be sold to a builder who, who would build, mm. you know, apartments on it. But in the meantime, we're going to use the land. And, and what happens is people will pay you pad rent, right? So they'll actually rent the space where the mobile home is parked mm -hmm. from you at crazy interest rates, 12, 15, 19%. And sometimes if they can't afford the actual home, they'll finance that from you. So they'll finance the mm -hmm. space and they'll finance the mobile home from you. So you can, you know, it's a very, very profitable business. All the yeah. while, you know, you could hold it five, 10 years, sell it to a developer down the road who wants to build something up or you build the, to develop the land yourself. Hmm. So it's not the sexiest yeah. people here, mobile home. Yeah. They're like, oh, you know, what are you doing that for? Yeah. But it's the same thing as, um, you know, self-storage and stuff like that. Hmm. Yeah. I would say. So I probably so butchered, first... I probably butchered no. the whole mobile home experience for you. But <laughs> Not even but remote. Tell... No, not at all. Yeah. No, I, I think that the mobile home idea came to me from going to some real estate investor club meetings in San Diego. Because I lived in Southern California for about 18 years wow. before I moved uh, to Vegas for three during COVID and then here for two. But moving to Southern California, I started to go to a bunch of different, you know, San Diego or Los Angeles or uh, just up and down the coast, uh, Palm Springs area, all those real estate investor clubs. And I, I met a guy, Joe Lahore, super nice guy and back in gosh, 2011 and 12, he, I think he had just started buying mobile home parks. Hmm. I'm like, that's an interesting choice. Why would you do that? And then after listening to him and going through, you know, the 11 and 12 where market prices were starting to go up and we were fixing and flipping, getting into construction and development stuff. And I realized around 2015, 16, that the fix and flips were just taking too long. So they're really chewing into the profitability. And I'm like, okay, what's the market cycle going to be doing? Is it going to crash? And there was so much indicator, so many indicators that, yeah, we're about ready for, you know, the, the eight years, the, the nine, 10 years after the crash, historically speaking, you know, blah, 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 12 years. I'm like, okay, I need to pivot. And I, I thought in a market downturn, what happens? People move out of those thousand dollar a month apartments into something that's more affordable because maybe they lost their job but they still need a place to live so affordable housing is going to increase in value 
So I thought, okay, well, what's, what does that look like? It seems to me like mobile home parks would be a really great idea. So after getting a, another partner and he brought in another partner, we decided let's buy this one in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And so this is six years ago, uh, 2018. And we closed on it in April. I think we bought it for 1.5 million and we had a big owner financing. I brought a lot of capital in uh, with my investors and we decided we're going to, you know, fix this up. We're going to add homes. We're going to do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the idea really was around the thought that the fix and flip market is going to die. We're about to enter into a recession because the market cycle is changing and let's start getting more cash flow properties so that we don't, you know, we're not always transactional. We have longer term wealth building. Mm. So that's sort of the impetus for everything. Makes sense. I like that. So, so you're buying it. Talk to us. Can you walk us through like one of the deals you've done recently? Like big picture sure. numbers, <clears throat> CapEx. Yeah. Oh gosh. You want, you want actual numbers, huh? Well, just, just an idea. Like you paid one <laughs> and a half for it, you know, yeah. this many yeah. homes. So that first one, yeah, that first one. So we made a ton of mistakes on it being our first. We knew it, it was too far out of the MSA. So there was not enough population to fill in the spots that were coming up vacant mm -hmm. or, or coming up uh, um, for rent. We couldn't fill in enough homes to really drive the NOI to where we thought. And so after five years of owning it, we sold that thing for two and a half million. Mm. And so we walked away with $500,000 profit at the end of the day. So five years, 500,000, not horrific, a solid base hit. Yeah. We made a ton of mistakes. It had a sewer lagoon, which meant that everybody's human waste would go into this four acre lake. That people would go swimming. <laughs> and then percolate <laughs> and then, yeah. And nobody swam, thankfully. Okay. And, but then the problem really existed where we started to bring in more homes and more people mm. than when we bought it. And the Oklahoma had the highest rainfall in 20 some years that third mm. summer. And so the lake started to rise and rise and rise. And the person who's, you know, keeping an eye on it with the county, she's like, hey, you're about ready to overflow. And if it does, that's a massive problem. Mm. So we're like panicking. What do we do? We got a septic truck to come and, ho you know, take the pump out. I think we spent $80,000 oh that God. summer. Wow. pumping water out, wastewater out. When it turns out a year later, she comes to us and she says, why don't you just do a land application on those four acres next to the property that was already designated for land application where you could take a hose and <laughs> pump that water onto that four acres of land next to the lake. <laughs> so for 300 bucks, we could have bought a pump and a hose. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> you know, so just rookie mistakes. Yeah. But we, we still did okay. You know, I think we got a little greedy. Uh, on year four, we had an offer for 3.7. Mm. And we said, let's wait till it gets to four. Wow. You know? <laughs> yeah. So you live and you learn. Yeah. No, that's a solid lesson. I guess the one thing I'm curious about you, so now you're in Puerto Rico. You said it was for p reasons that you have people that moved over as well. Yeah. And for some tax a benefits. A lot of friends here. Yeah. There's some tax benefits. And then the water. And the water. <laughs> Well, I love the water. How is it working remotely from there? I'm doing the same thing I've always done. Do you have I to get on? My, do you have to get on a lot of flights to go check on projects, or are you doing? You have a lot of boots on the ground. No, I have a lot of boots on the ground, and I, I've got partners that are the boots on the ground. I'm more of the uh, capital raising, investor relations, mm -hmm. quarterly reports, you know, K ones, and just all that kind of stuff. I also focus a lot on the operating agreements that we need to draft or create or review or yeah. you know we talk about loan documents often so i go to properties from time to time yeah maybe not as much as i want to but i wasn't going frequently to the mobile home parks you know for the last five years so it's uh as as that's become the predominant portion of our portfolio we've got a regional manager we've got my partner brandon so all that stuff is covered and I'm not a GC and Brandon is. So it's not really important for me to go travel to look at beat up mobile homes. <laughs> yeah. How does it work if you, like, let's say you living in Puerto Rico and you flip a property, do you have to pay, like it's another state. So how does that tax work? Does it, do you still get the benefits of like that 2% federal or is that? 
and this yeah incorrect. so i've got two puerto rico llcs mm -hmm. and the way i've structured it is all of my us based llcs now pay a management fee to my puerto rico company mm. and that puerto rico company is then taxed at the you know the the rate that uh, is provided by the various tax incentives here and it's ran off on the other side. That's that's freaking genius. Okay, I like that one. I don't know about genius. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, but I'm just gonna work work the system. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I just found out from a a guy for a private investor I met recently, and he's ninety something years old. He literally told me this idea, and I was like, that's just genius. He's like, you'll talk, you'll hear a lot about like cost segregation, depreciation, and like going against mm -hmm. against income. He's like, that's that's all good. I don't like that as much. But he's like, what I'll do is I'll go buy a property for let's say a hundred, two hundred thousand, and it's completely obsolete. There's no need for it. Whatever it is, I'll buy it. I'll go donate it to the city, and that two hundred fifty thousand dollar house, I'll turn it into a little bit of a greenland park. I'll give it to the city. I'll get a million six in tax credits. It wipes off all of my tax liability. And he's like, and it's good for six years. And I'm like, you son of a gun. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely that's genius. Beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. You know, the cost seg thing is always interesting to me because everybody's like, here's how you can, you know, buy this property and then and just wipe away all of your income for the year. I'm like, yeah, but at some point that it's coming back to haunt you in a massive way. When you depreciate all of that on the first year, I don't know why it's such an important part to wipe off all of your W-2 taxes. Yeah. There are so many other ways to do it. Just a great example of what you just said. You know, take $100,000 and and buy a property and yeah. donate it. You know, it's such a cleaner way to do it that doesn't have a long-term negative repercussion. Yeah. So it sounds sexy. It sounds like, oh, I'm smart. But when you're looking at the tax bill six years later, I don't know that it necessarily is. It's true. Yeah. Because there's a, there's a, uh, um, a depreciation recapture if you do decide to sell it later on. So it's unless you decide to hold on to it forever, and then when you die, your heirs will inherit it, and then it'll become a property that they can depreciate again. Yeah. And even if you do a 1031, you still need to recapture that prior to the 1031. Correct. So, you know, it's coming back. The, the government's going to want their money. Yeah, you're, you're going to get screwed in the long term if you, uh, unless you're deciding to hold on to it forever. That's the only time right. that's, there's a benefit yeah. to doing that. But it's interesting because now this has become something that's so important, at least for me to find out, because Uncle Sam's your biggest partner. And if you can get rid of that liability, you can grow so much faster. Yeah. So that's like the, the biggest yeah. thing. Tony Robbins talks about that in one of his more, more recent books. It's called Money Master the Game. He talks about taxation mm. and the negative impact that it has on long-term wealth creation. Mm -hmm. I think it's a phenomenal book if you guys haven't read it yet. Yeah, I'll definitely look into it. That's helpful. Yeah. Awesome, Roger. Well, thank you so much, man. This has been great. We really do appreciate you spending some time with us today. Uh, We're done. <laughs> well, if there's, any, on, if there's anything else you want to throw into the fire man we're ready for you <laughs> you guys should come down to you know come down to the puerto rico and we'll just do this uh, uh once a week I love <laughs> it. it's been fun we have yeah, a mastermind really group if you are at all open or interested in being involved in it it's a lot of agents turned investors and some contractors yes. that are on there and everybody's just spitting out ideas that are helpful for every person. So if you ever want to be associated or involved with that, we're more than happy to, to, to Absolutely. bring you in. Send me the information. I, I Again, I'm here to serve. You know, being a real estate investor hasn't provided much fulfillment in my life necessarily. I mean, yeah. it's fun. There's, there's good things. But giving back is the main reason why I've started my coaching, my membership group program, all of those different reasons so that I can you know, as the old jazz musicians say, look, you've got to teach it to the younger kids, right? Yeah. You got to yeah. create the art and then move that down the road. So here's what I'm doing. Love it, man. What's awesome. one thing that you want to leave the audience with? Oh, gosh, you have such deep questions, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, get out and vote, number one. <laughs> you know, just remember that there's a million properties out there and there's probably 10 people you're ever going to want to do business with. Mm. Get really good at discerning who you want to do business with. Mm. And do they fight the fire with you or do they run, you know, it's been my biggest lesson of all, you know, just find some great projects. And then my partners that I had, you know, in 2014 or 15, they just couldn't look the fire in the eye and say, I'm going to beat you regardless of what it takes. Mm. And, that's literally cost me millions of dollars, those choices to partner with those people. Mm. Yeah. So just step back and just say, we're gonna put all this in writing. That's yeah. the biggest lesson. Yeah, it's true. 
I heard the saying, it says, when your heart gets bigger than your head, that's when you're in trouble. So it's, you, that's a good, that's even a good if you one feel, for you. <laughs> I like that. It, that's, <laughs> it, that's why it resonated with me. I was just like, yeah. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I get to remember that one. That's good. And yeah. if someone wants to reach out, connect or collaborate, what's the best way to do so? Yeah. Hey, thank you for that. You know, rogerking.com is my website. It's kind of a hub. You can go to my, uh, these podcast interviews. Uh, I've got, you know, my course that I've recently launched the real estate investing accelerator founders group, um, nice. for people that want like a step-by-step -step process to buy their first real estate investment. Mm. Uh, we'll do level two here very shortly where it's the people that have already bought, you know, two or three buildings or houses or whatever, and they want to scale that, or maybe they want to change from one sector wholesaling into fixing and flipping or yeah. luxury homes into, mobile homes how do you change sectors and scale those so all of that's there my social media is all on there and if you just want to say hi i'm i'm here i'm just sitting on the beach probably. <laughs> awesome man hopefully i'm <laughs> jealous yeah. yeah me too yeah literally come on down it's, <laughs> it's an open invitation well we I, appreciate I, having you. i uh went to a bachelor party i'll give you guys a quick story in puerto rico in puerto yeah. rico mm -hmm. Uh, uh, and I forgot where we stayed, but somewhere in San Juan or old San Juan. And yeah, uh, we went to that big casino there with all those restaurants and yeah. it was probably 25 of us. We all got dinner, big steak dinner and the bill comes and it's 150 bucks each or whatever it was. And let's say it's 200. It's easier math. And, uh, my buddy collects all the money and he's like, all right, guys, we've got two options here. We can take all this money and put it down on red or black. <laughs> and if we win, right? Uh -huh. It's a free it's meal. Free. It's free. <laughs> if we lose, then we got to pay double, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> right? So somehow, some way we convinced the waiter to just let us go and leave the table, leave the, <laughs> leave the restaurant, go to the casino floor and put down all this money and just come back. So I think we probably gave him a card and said, hey, hold on to that. So we went yeah. and we put it uh, all like four grand or whatever on red or black and we hit. Oh, well, we spun the we spun the roulette wheel. We hit and there was one person you that know, didn't do it. Jamie yeah. Mooring yeah. <laughs> said, I'm not I'm not betting the 200. He didn't do it. So he had to pay for his dinner. But we all had a free. <laughs> but when I have a video of that somewhere. It's the casino like erupted like there was, <laughs> was free food. Was 20 like 20 <laughs> maniac meathead guys who had probably 10 drinks each. <laughs> and uh right. screaming and yelling in the casino that we had just won uh whatever we uh, won but it was that's, that's my word. puerto rico that's when i when i hear puerto I rico it. i think about that you know the thing one of the things that i love most about being here are the people yeah they are so extremely nice yeah i mentioned that i lived in la for eight, 18 years and then vegas for three after that and never did i talk to my neighbors just you don't do that. Yeah. And here I'm talking to my neighbors literally every day. That's you cool. know, my dog, she'll walk around, she goes into their houses, they puppy sit her. But like there's this idea of, hey, we're all on an island. Let's talk. Yeah. And I, I just I love that aspect of it. Are your neighbors born and raised like Puerto Rico or are they transplants too? A few of them are. Yeah. Uh, not all of them. There's there's a doctor a few doors down. There's a few doctors that live here. They're all you know, born and born and raised, um, a couple lawyers and, mm. uh, just everybody's just really nice. Yeah, that's cool. You know, and, I know there's uh, some I'm big, just, big old school uh, EXP people, like some of the EXP rep, like we're both EXP realty. Yeah. They were early on at EXP. They've got major revenue share, like big time, like three, 400,000 yeah. a month. Yeah. And they're living in Puerto Rico. Yeah. And yeah. I know a lot of crypto people went to Puerto Rico, right? Yeah, they're all about two miles away from where I live. Yeah, <laughs> like Dorado, those bastards. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, some of the real estate prices have really exploded here. Yeah, like a friend of mine asked me to, you know, give his idea, give him my ideas on bidding on a house. What four months before the pandemic, hmm. and the house was listed for five million dollars, and he offered four point two, and they settled. He bought it. And literally within a year, it was worth 17. What? Yeah. Yeah. That's where it went. What that does 17 fast. million dollars get you in Puerto Rico? No offense. That I feel like that's, no, I mean, it's in an ultra that, exclusive neighborhood, you know, resort living 6,500 square foot house wow. on a lake, on a golf course, across the street from the ocean. 
next to two billionaires. You know, wow, a this... friend of mine just sold his condo for twelve point five million in December. Wow. Yeah, condo. I was in Old San Juan maybe six <laughs> months ago, and uh, I was looking up like I opened up Zillow, looked it up there. Condos in Old San Juan were selling for two, three million bucks, and I was like, "This is insane." It doesn't surprise me, but that's crazy. Crazy. Yeah. <laughs> wild it's just i mean yeah so it's a great place i mean is it worth that much well no i don't i don't think so but okay so that's what real estate is right no yeah. it changes on demand okay yeah. that's great yeah now i'm extra jealous all right well <laughs> well roger thank you so much man yeah. this has been great we really do uh enjoyed spending some time with you and and i will send yeah. you the information for our investment mastermind yeah. we meet every oh, tuesday I'd love that. every tuesday at four o'clock yeah, totally. You just send me the invitation. I'm, I'll be there. Awesome. Hero and John, you, you guys are doing a great job. And I've been Thank listening you. to a few of these other podcasts and some great, great interviews. So thanks for welcoming me in. Yeah, of course. Thanks, Thank Roger. you for being here. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you, guys. Have a wonderful weekend. You too, right. man.